So yes, thank you to the organizers for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk. Um, I'm hopefully going to explain a little bit about uh, yeah, spectral theory of um, some locally symmetric spaces uh, and try to highlight some of the connections with uh, both previous talks and uh, future talks. Uh, so I'll start off with some um, generalities from spectral geometry. Uh, so hopefully you're sort of familiar with the idea of um, the Laplace operator or the Laplace Beltrami operator uh, on a Riemannian manifold. So it's the uh, divergence of the gradient and it uh, acts on smooth functions on the manifold. And uh, since it uh, only is defined on smooth functions, um, if you want to look at L2, uh, you end up with an unbounded operator on L2, and it turns out to be symmetric. And when you want to talk about the spectrum, uh, of this operator, formally you have to uh, define it on a Sobolev space by completing the uh, compactly supported smooth functions uh, with respect to an appropriate uh, Sobolev norm, and then uh, view the Laplacian as going from this Sobolev space to uh, L2. And um, we'll be looking at uh, the spectrum of the negative of the Laplacian. So uh, we'll let this is what we'll call the L2 spectrum. And we'll denote it spec of, of delta. And those are those uh, complex numbers such that delta plus lambda times uh, the identity uh, fails to have a bounded inverse from L2 back to this uh, Sobolev space. Okay, and uh, yeah, since, since uh, Laplacian is symmetric, uh, the, the spectrum will be a subset of R, and from general theory, it's non-empty and closed. And what we're going to uh, call the bottom of the spectrum, uh, we denote by lambda zero of M, and this is, um, yeah, so we start off by saying, okay, this is the infimum of the spectrum. And uh, we have this Green's identity here, so uh, which lets us um, express the bottom of the spectrum in terms of this Rayleigh quotient. And since it's a, a quotient of uh, two positive quantities here, this is always non-negative. So uh, yeah, the uh, the bottom of the spectrum will uh, be non-negative, and th this is why we, we chose to look at the uh, the eigenvalues or generalized eigenvalues of minus the Laplacian. So um, some sort of basic examples, right? If if m is compact, then uh, the constant function is uh, a compactly supported smooth function on M, and when you stick uh, the constant function into this, you get zero. So uh, 
Um, and okay, for, with a bit more work, this also holds for finite volume m. Uh, but also, it's not too difficult to see that um, lambda zero of r is zero. You take uh, yeah longer and longer approximations of the constant function on r. <laughs> Um, so, the sort of starting point for, for my way of thinking about this is uh, looking at uh, geometrically finite hyperbolic manifolds. And we have this uh, theorem due to Patterson, I guess, for uh, d equals 1 here and Sullivan more generally that um, if, if gamma is a geometrically finite subgroup of SO d plus 1 comma 1 uh, and delta gamma is the critical exponent of gamma, then we have the following formula for uh, the bottom of the spec L2 spectrum of uh, this hyperbolic manifold. So it's given by delta gamma times d minus delta gamma if uh, critical exponent is greater than d over 2 and it's d squared over 4 otherwise. And uh, part of this statement is that uh, if you look at the smallest, uh, yeah, the smallest eigen value here. So uh, lambda zero is in fact an L2 eigenvalue. So it's, there's really an uh, eigenfunction, not just an approximate eigenfunction uh, in L2 corresponding to lambda zero when delta gamma is greater than d over two. So yeah, th this generalizes to uh, other rank one symmetric spaces. Um, I guess Corlett's, Hamstadt. There's yeah, quite a few uh, people have worked on this, and uh, in this case, uh, when you have delta gram delta gamma greater than d over two. Um, Lex and Phillips showed that there's a spectral gap. So uh, lambda zero is a simple eigenvalue. And then there's a gap to the next eigenvalue. And uh, this turns out to be quite useful if you want to do counting or um, studying dynamics for these uh, on, the, on these manifolds. So it, it lets you use sort of powerful tools from representation theory to sort of attack these problems. And um, yeah, so lots of the sort of questions you're interested in uh, are sort of first solved uh, for the case delta gamma greater than d over two. And so al already here we have sort of the, the motivation behind what I'm going to talk about. It's you know, okay, so let's, let's try to think of um, higher rank groups here. And, uh, you know, if we can find uh, discrete subgroup gamma of a higher rank group that has uh, sort of this, this same spectral gap, uh, you can then, uh, again, you know, apply these representation theoretic methods and uh, prove strong results about dynamics and counting for these uh, qu quotients. So, um, yeah, so I, I mentioned that uh, th this spectral gap here, uh, that the, the bottom of the spectrum is correspond, it's a simple eigenvalue and um, corresponds to an eigenfunction, and th th this is a, a general feature. So if we have the uh, following result d 
due to solvent. So if you have a non-compact uh, Riemannian manifold, um, for every lambda uh, less or equal to the bottom of the spectrum, uh, there exists some uh, positive eigenfunction. Uh, if lambda is greater than lambda zero, then there are no positive eigenfunctions. And uh, the L2 eigenspace for lambda zero is at most one dimensional. And if lambda zero is indeed an eigenvalue, then uh, there's a corresponding uh, positive eigenfunction that spans this eigenspace. So, uh, yeah, so th this follows, it's, it's a, quite a general statement, so it follows from um, some very ge general facts about the Laplace operator. So it's, uh, yeah, f f for this last part, for example, um, this, the, the two main ingredients are the fact that, uh, yeah, such an eigenfunction would minimize this Rayleigh quotient, and then uh, this together with the uh, the maximum principle for uh, for eigenfunctions of the Laplacian um, sort of almost directly give this this statement. So this this is sort of the the picture we have. Uh, positive spectrum, so spe I positive eigenfunctions on one side of lambda zero and L2 spectrum uh, on the other. And you can sort of ask, okay, so what, what happens at lambda zero? Right? Do, you, uh, yeah, do you get a, an eigenfunction or not there? Uh, L2 eigenfunction. So the uh, yeah, when we go to higher rank uh, symmetric spaces, um, if if gamma is not a lattice, and uh, okay, this G, um, if you make sure that it has uh, no rank one factors, then um, there will be no. Uh, L2 eigenfunction corresponding to lambda zero. So this is uh, sort of the <coughs> theorem I'd like to explain a bit, how it connects with um, yeah, th these concepts we've seen earlier. So the first um, sort of useful thing about symmetric spaces is that uh, there's not just one uh, useful differential operator. So there's a whole family. So we let uh, x <coughs> in the Riemannian symmetric space g mod k, and then uh, this uh, D script of X will denote the algebra of all uh, G invariant differential operators. So here, uh, G is acting on functions on uh, X by translation. And this, uh, this algebra is commutative and it's dimensionally equal to the rank of G and uh, Laplace operator is uh, in it. So we'll say that a uh, smooth function on X, that is an eigenfunction of every uh, element of D of X uh, is called a joint eigenfunction. 
information, you mean number of generators of the graph test. Yeah. That is a bit of space. Yeah. Okay, so um, <coughs> we were originally looking at uh, just looking at eigenfunctions of uh, the Laplace operator. Uh, but we know from this theorem of Sullivan that uh, if, if you have uh, uh, eigenfunction of the Laplacian in L2, then uh, it's a simple eigenvalue. So if you have uh, any operator in D of X, we can do this sort of standard trick where we commute uh, the two operators and we see that uh, yeah, D acting on our function is again a, uh, an eigenfunction of the Laplacian. So this means that um, uh, this function, this, if, if there is an eigenfunction at the bottom of the spectrum, uh, L2 spectrum, then uh, it's in fact a joint eigenfunction. And uh, this is useful because the, the joint eigenfunctions uh, on, on the space X are well understood. So uh, let's fix uh, an Iwasawa decomposition of G. So G equals K being maximal compact A N uh, as we saw this morning. And then we define this H function from G to the Lie algebra of A uh, via this formula. And now uh, we can quite explicitly uh, construct a whole family of joint eigenfunctions. So uh, given any linear form on uh, the Lie algebra of A, uh, we define a function uh, phi psi uh, positive uh, through this formula. And uh, yeah, you can see that putting the inverse here means that uh, yeah, translating uh, you know, th this does in fact give a uh, a function on x, so a, or a, a right k invariant function on uh, g. Okay, and um, yes, then with these, uh, each of these eigenfunctions, we use them to define uh, characters from uh, the algebra of invariant differential operators to C uh, by uh, this formula. So we'll denote by uh, chi psi of D the uh, eigenfunction, uh, eigenvalue of <coughs> D acting on phi psi. And it, it turns out that every character of the, uh, the algebra may be expressed in, in this form uh, for some linear functional uh, psi, uh, which is greater or equal to the half sum of the positive roots of uh, GA uh, and greater or equal to this, this is the order um, sort of based on when we restrict to the positive vial chamber, uh, yeah, corresponding to this positive choice of roots. And once we've done this, it turns out we can uh, give a nice formula for uh, the action of 
the Laplace operator on these uh, eigenfunctions. So, um, okay, the, there's the choice of scaling in the uh, yeah in, in in the choice of Riemannian metric or invariant G invariant Riemannian metric on X. But if you scale things in the right way, um, you you get this formula. And then this lets us uh, compute the L2 spectrum of uh, symmetric space X. It's, it's given by this formula. So th this sort of corresponds to you know, psi equal to rho there. Yeah. Question here? Yeah. What happens when psi is not greater than rho? Do you still get an eigenfunction? So, uh, yes. Um, we'll, uh, let's see if I... Uh, yeah, okay. <coughs> it's, you can define an eigenfunction that way. Um, the, uh, the point is, is that uh, all the characters uh, arise uh, in, in this way for some psi greater or equal to rho. So if you, you start off with some uh, psi that isn't greater or equal to rho, then okay, you have, you'll have a joint eigenfunction. And then, um, yeah, th this, uh, this sort of formula will define a character and then this character, then you can swap out your psi for some psi that is in fact greater or equal to rho. Um, you'll see quite explicitly what, what I mean by this uh, momentarily. Okay, and right, since uh, D uh, D of X uh, consists of the invariant differential operators. Um, once we have uh, th these functions uh, phi psi, we can translate them by elements of G to get a whole family of uh, joint eigenfunctions. Uh, and it turns out that so yeah, we don't actually need to translate by all the elements of G. So if we uh, just work out the formulas here, so if you, you take an element KAN corresponding to the Iwasawa decomposition and act on phi psi, um, okay, the <laughs> N part won't do anything. Uh, the A part will just uh, give a scaling and then, okay, the k part uh, you can't do much with, but uh, if then if you take some element in uh, the centralizer of A and k, uh, you'll see that this also leaves uh, the, these functions invariant, so um, what, we're, what we'll be interested in is uh, K mod M <coughs> sort of acting on, on these functions. Uh, so the, the example to have in mind here is the hyperbolic plane. And uh, so here these, uh, these functions phi uh, correspond precisely to taking the imaginary part. And then, okay, the, the S here is the, the choice of psi. And using uh, this formula, you see that uh, you, you have this eigenvalue.
Okay, and we have the sort of following uh, results of Furstenberg and Karpelovich. So if we let uh, pos psi uh, denote the uh, positive uh, joint eigenfunctions, uh, whose eigenvalues are given by this character uh, chi psi, uh, then Uh, if psi is greater or equal to rho, then uh, this set uh, is a complete set of minimal uh, elements of uh, pos psi. And by minimal, I mean that if, if you have a function f that is uh, bounded above by one of these functions, uh, then f is in fact just a multiple, constant multiple of uh, the functions. So now we observe that, okay, this is uh, a cone. And so by Choquet's theorem, we uh, can express uh, any of the elements in the cone uh, as a sort of integral of the extremal elements. <coughs> okay, and what we're going to be doing is using this, um, this formula uh, when we study uh, functions on uh, x mod gamma. So uh, if we have a positive eigenfunction uh, f on x mod gamma, then we can also view it as a gamma invariant uh, element of pos uh, psi for some psi greater or equal to rho. And as noted, we can then write it as uh, some integral for the Furstenberg boundary of these, uh, the translates of these phi psi. And what we'll use now is that this uh, measure mu f uh, is unique, the so determined by f. So, well, we know that f is gamma invariant, so we get the same thing if we put uh, a gamma in here. And then uh, working out what this is gives the following formula. So, uh, we can then use the co-cycle properties to write this in this way. And so by the uniqueness of this measure, uh, we see that it satisfies this relation. Uh, so this was but there was a slight discussion on terminology uh, earlier. Yeah. So, um, yeah, this isn't a conformal action, but we want to have a name for measures that have this type of, uh, this type of invariance. So we'll just say that this, uh, a measure that satisfies this is a gamma psi conformal measure. So what we've <coughs> um, shown so far is that, okay, if we uh, have a, a joint eigenfunction on 
uh, x mod gamma, then we can write it in this form, uh, where measure nu is some uh, gamma psi conformal measure. And um, here we have, OK, this was something that I guess wasn't mentioned earlier, but um, it's uh, a fact that you can only have a uh, gamma psi conformal measure if uh, psi is uh, greater or equal to the growth indicator function of gamma. So uh, combining this with the uh, with this statement that psi is greater or equal to rho, we then get yeah this uh, inequality here. Uh, and so this is then connecting back to our investigation of the bottom of the L2 spectrum. So um, if we have an L2 uh, eigenfunction for <coughs> lambda zero, uh, then we have a uh, gamma psi conformal measure with uh, this function uh, being square integrable. Right. And now this uh, theorem I mentioned earlier follows from uh, the following two results. So uh, the first is joint work with uh, HEO that, okay, we, uh, we can bound uh, the L2 norm. So it's most interesting when we take mu1 equals mu2 here uh, from below by uh, the BMS measure, uh, the, yeah, the volume of uh, G mod M and gamma the, with respect to the BMS measure corresponding to nu1 and nu2. And then this uh, combines with a theorem of Frederick and uh, Lee uh, that says that uh, for higher rank groups G um, with no rank one factors, uh, if you have a finite uh, BMS measure, then gamma is in fact a lattice. So yeah, combining these two, you see that there can't be any uh, square integral uh, E news when gamma is not a lattice. So I'll uh, say a few words about the proof of this. So this is um, yeah something that's called the smearing argument uh, due to Sullivan and Thurston. So uh, here's. Sullivan's story of the proof of this. So uh, it's called the smearing argument because it's a sort of uh, yeah. you 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 smear out uh, geodesic somehow. Um, I'll give a a slightly more uh, detailed picture. So, um, what we're going to do is. We'll you could say in the rank one, that's, uh, yeah, sorry, but that's not in there. Yeah, so th this, is, this is all, um, yeah, for context here, F here is the, uh, the Hausdorff dimension of uh, the limit set. Uh, uh, yeah, so they're looking at. Um, G equals SL2C, right? So F here is uh, the Hausdorff dimension of the limit set of discrete subgroup of SL2C. And 
Okay, this, this corresponds to uh, d over 2 being 1. So they're, yeah, they, they looked at you know, the, this case, and um, <coughs> this also works for other rank 1 <coughs> symmetric spaces. And so we sort of figured out the details to do this in higher rank. So the, the idea is to use um, the Hopf parametrization of G mod M. So uh, yeah, this is going to be Uh, G mod M, and then you take um, two points in uh, the open orbit of G on <coughs> F times F, and you look at uh, the maximal flat between them. So this will be. Yeah. Mm. Make this to be psi, this to be eta, and then you look at w psi eta as a, a unit uh, neighborhood of this maximal flat. And then what you do is you put a measure on uh, the product of x uh, uh, times uh, this open orbit uh, using this formula. So those other guys are the Choquet measures? The measures given by the Choquet theorem? New <coughs> uh, no, so here new one and new two will be uh, yeah, uh, okay, yes. So any, th this works for any, any two uh, conformal measures. So, uh, so you're going to make a uh, put put a new measure on this space uh, by you know you put the uh, the volume Riemannian volume on each of these uh, neighborhoods of the uh, flats, and then you put. Uh, these uh, two conformal measures on uh, the components of the boundary, and then in a in a similar way to uh, yeah the definition of these BMS measures, uh, you can find uh, a function phi uh, so that uh, okay th this whole thing is gamma invariant and. Uh, this this phi uh, it isn't it isn't mysterious in, in any way it's yeah it, it it's basically these uh, these exponential factors that uh, you need to yeah get these functions e nu one and e nu two and. Uh, what you basically do then is um, sort of disintegrate this measure and rearrange things. Is the is the so the key words here? So the the fact is that you can yeah so sort of disintegrate the volume measure along the flat as uh, like the measure on A along the flat, and then the the volume measure on uh, a, a ball that's transverse to the flat of lower dimension. So um, th th that's sort of the, the key idea is to getting this estimate. And so uh, that was what I wanted to say about the proof of this, uh, yeah, this theorem about the the bottom of the spectrum, um, 
And now I'll sort of briefly touch on a bit, bit more of the uh, representation theoretic side of these things. So uh, recall that a unitary representation of uh, semi-simple Lie group G is said to be tempered uh, if its matrix coefficients are uh, almost square integrable. So they're in L2 plus epsilon for any epsilon greater than zero. Uh, and what we'll mostly be interested in is when the unitary <coughs> representation is the, the quasi-regular <laughs> representation of G on L2 G mod gamma. So uh, a function f is a matrix coefficient for this representation. Uh, if it's an integral of this form, And going back to this rank one theory, um, the, uh, at least part, part of this theorem I stated earlier can be rephrased in terms of representation theory. So uh, I guess this is for uh, any discrete <coughs> subgroup of SO d plus one comma one. Um, this rep unitary representation of uh, G on L2 G mod gamma is tempered if and only if uh, delta gamma is greater than D over 2. Is it the other way around? Less than D over 2. Yes. It's, yes. It, <laughs> okay, if, if it's not, yeah, uh, less or equal to. <laughs> so the group has to be small. So it's yes. Like yes. Small. Okay, and what we ask is, you know, does this hold uh, more generally in, um, in higher rank? Uh, and if we're going to view uh, the growth indicator function as a higher rank, uh, higher rank analog of the critical exponent, then uh, you'd like uh, not, the, not this relation, but the, the opposite of it to also hold in in higher rank. And uh, yeah, th this is actually true for, um, for an Ossov uh, subgroups gamma, but uh, okay, an Ossov uh, with respect to a minimal par parabolic. So then we know that L2 G mod gamma uh, is tempered if and only if uh, Psi gamma is less or equal to rho. Uh, and the key input here um, is the, the local mixing of, uh, yeah, that uh, Pratush talked about earlier. So from, from the formulas he gave, uh, you, you can work out that uh, those, yeah, matrix coefficients can only be uh, almost square integrable uh, if uh, psi gamma is less or equal to rho. Uh, and it turns out that we actually um, don't really know any examples that don't satisfy this criteria. So uh, all and also subgroups that we know are quite small in, in, this, in this sense. Uh, so they turn out to be tempered. Uh, and more generally, um, don't think we know any, uh, know of any Zariski dense gamma <coughs> such that L2 G mod gamma is non tempered. Uh, Except for lattices. Except for lattices is, is the, yeah, uh, a key point here. Um, yeah, so this is what I had to say. So thanks for listening.
questions? Can you, go, can you go back to the last slide? I'm just curious, like, so what is this, for all examples we know, we have this due to Kaminsky O. So is this a theorem? Or yeah, so they, they, they bounded, um, they looked at the size of the growth indicator function, and I guess for Hitchin subgroups of uh, PSL DR and, uh, and also subgroups of products of rank one uh, groups, you, you always have this. This is one of their <coughs> results. So, so there's some subset of <coughs> the representations where this is known. Yes, and then, yeah, otherwise we. Sorry, is it linked to uh, the work of Patrice and Marino where they show uh, for a specific critical exponent uh, uh, that it goes and has to go down? Yeah, it's so Hitchin uses that for simple root, the critical exponent uh, is at most one, right? It uses this uh, work of San Marino. <coughs> okay, I choose it. Yeah, it uses it. Any other questions? Well, let's thank Sam again. <laughs>